We are very honored to have a keynote speaker with us tonight. Nikhil Goyle is, is a, is a, works for Uber, and he is a, a native of Huntsville, Alabama. He graduated with his BSE in computer science from Vanderbilt University, and he's also an entrepreneur. He went on to form two companies, one in Mumbai and one in Silicon Valley. Then he went on to work for McKinsey for two years in um, Silicon Valley, and now since 2015, he has worked for Uber, where he is the head of, head of product development for Uber Elevate. Elevate. So I am very excited to welcome Nikhil here tonight. Without any further ado, Nikhil Goyle. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me in the back? Oh, good. Cool. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Steve. Uh, my name is Nikhil Goyle. I'm the head of product for advanced programs at Uber. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about Uber Elevate. Uh, so Uber Elevate is Uber's initiative to fast forward to the future of urban aviation. Uh, who here has heard of Uber Elevate or read our white paper? Only a few of you. OK, cool. Well, so before I dig into Elevate, let me talk a little bit about Uber and why we're interested in aviation. Uh, who here is taking an Uber? A few more. So this is what the first version of the Uber app looked like. And we were thrilled, by the way. We didn't focus on things like UX. We didn't focus on the tiny things. We focused, we focused on how do we create an app where you can push a button, get a black town car in San Francisco. Sorry. Um, so we focused on how do you get a black town car in San Francisco. And this is what the first instance of the app looked like. And we were super, super pumped when we saw three cars taking a trip at once and when we saw 12 cars actually doing trips. We were super, duper excited. Since this point, we've grown just a little bit. Uh, since the Uber Black product, we decided, hey, how do we launch a more economical product where anybody can drive for Uber? And that's when we came out with UberX. And through this process, we, began fo we, we became focused on how do we actually expand our mission? Because our mission to date has been providing transportation as reliable as running water to everyone everywhere. Well, we thought, how do we actually make our mission bigger? How do we actually focus on making cities smarter and more efficient places to live? And this became more about transportation, less about transportation, but actually more about how do we reduce car ownership? How do we reduce the percentage of people on Earth who own a car? We actually recently surveyed people aged 25 to 34 in urban cities around the world. And what we found was that 10% of people in these cities had already given up either purchasing a car or actually sold their car because they could take Uber instead, which is staggering, by the way. And, and what this led us to is a goal of actually reducing the price of Uber from the price it is today to below the cost of car ownership, which led us to an experiment just a couple of years ago, we said, well, there are a lot of trips happening between the same origins and the same destinations at around the same time. And so our engineers proposed an experiment. They said, well, what if we could take these multiple trips and use a single car to serve them at any given time? And ride pooling or, or car sharing has been talked about for a long time. But in Uber fashion, we said, hey, let's give it a shot. And it turns out this experiment was a resounding success. This is San Francisco on a slow day. The cars in green here are actually Uber pool trips. San Francisco, over 50% of trips during rush hour are served via Uber pool, which is astounding because your trip to home or to work can be between half or even a third or even a fourth of what an UberX would normally cost, which is awesome. Sometimes you're, it's actually cheaper than the subway or the Muni in a city where you live. And since then, Uber has grown quite a bit. Today, we encompass over 77 countries, over 600 cities, and 65 million monthly, rider, monthly active riders who pull open the app every month to take a ride on Uber. And part of this, this global scale is really, really important to how we operate today and how we are going to operate Uber Elevate in the future, which I'll talk about in just a minute. So before I dig into Elevate, um, well, one quick thing. So we've also launched autonomous cars in a couple of cities. This was our launch in San Francisco, where we partnered with OEMs, including Volvo, as you see here, to launch autonomous cars in San Francisco. And our robotics efforts with the uh, Advanced Technology Group in Pittsburgh and now San Francisco have also further led us into how do we reduce the, the, the price of car, uh, how do we reduce the price of Uber below the price of car ownership. So before I dig into urban aviation, we wanted to show you a little bit of video uh, of what we're up to. 
and then I'll dig into some of the specifics. Did we get these? Okay. Uber is on Earth to crack the code on urban mobility. It's what we've been working on in different ways for many years. How do we make our cities smarter? How do we help people move through their cities with greater efficiency? So far, we've been focused on ground-based transportation. And for us, the natural next step was flight. We started off by asking ourselves the question, why can't we fly today? Why can't we take to the air? So in Uber fashion, we took a deep look at the challenge of flying people in and around cities on demand. We quickly realized it wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when. Flying really can replace driving in many cases, saving people precious time. And it can be done in a way that is ultimately less expensive than car ownership, as well as friendly to the environment and the community. But the big win is the time savings. Trips that can take hours on the ground can be reduced to minutes in the air. Giving time back to people is something we're very passionate about at Uber. That's more time with family, more time growing our economies, and lower stress for everyone. We started developing a first principle view of how to go about doing this, and what sort of vehicle it would take to accomplish this mission. And during this process, we discovered that this vehicle was not a helicopter, but rather electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, or EV tolls. EV tolls will make our lives easier, our commutes shorter, and our cities cleaner and more productive. They'll fundamentally change how our cities function and how we live in them. At NASA, my team and I spent decades researching the technology that enables this, Distributed Electric Propulsion, or DEP. This technology allows these aircraft to operate in urban centers safely and quietly. Skyscrapers change cities by taking advantage of the space above cities. Urban aviation will do the same, and in the process it will reduce congestion on the ground and make our cities feel more open and more accessible for everyone. Of course, all of this won't just happen overnight, but in true Uber fashion, we're pushing forward as quickly as possible. And we're not going at it alone. We're already working with manufacturers and suppliers, governments and regulators from dozens of countries, the most innovative engineers all over the world, investors and real estate developers, and NASA and air traffic control. We're excited to unite this community around a common goal, so this idea can take off safely, but also as quickly as possible. I believe as we start to launch this Uber product, you'll work closely with the cities, closely with the county, very close to the state of Texas. At Uber, we're not only providing a marketplace for millions of riders, we're also working with local and federal governments to build out a network operations center and air traffic management systems to make these flights practical and safe. No one has a monopoly on the future. It's going to be shared. And so will the journey that takes us there. And the benefits of VTOL transportation will be shared by everybody. Just like we did with Uber Pool on the ground, we'll be able to make commuting by air equally as affordable. Together with our partners, we've created the Uber Elevate Network to usher in this future of transportation. The shared passion and the combined expertise are powerful. The reason I think this industry is going to be successful faster than anyone thinks is every single product-oriented person, every engineer, anyone that had an inkling that they wanted to be in that space when they were a little kid is dying to build this. It's very much the early morning on day one of this adventure. The Uber Elevate network will be growing to include more cities, technology partners, and investors. If you're as passionate as we are about this future, join us. You're the lucky one. You're the one that gets to shape the future of this city for the next century. And that's what we're doing, ladies and gentlemen. We're creating something that folks in 2117 are gonna look back and say they were truly visionary. Cool, thank you. Um, so I don't have a ton of time left, I think. So I'll speed through the rest. Um, this is an Uber chopper ride that uh, we've done Uber chopper over 100 times in cities across the world. As you heard in the video, uh, our first instinct was, why can't we fly in cities? Why can't we use helicopters, vehicles that already exist, to fly in cities today via a normal Uber product? Well, as you heard, there were a lot of problems. We, we sat down to write our Elevate white paper, and we discovered that helicopters had problems with noise, problems with safety, problems with efficiency, and ultimately problems with cost. Helicopter rides, we, we decided and we determined that we would never be able to get the cost for a helicopter ride down below that price of car ownership. And for us, that was a deal breaker. 
And so we started looking at distributed electric propulsion. We started working with Mark Moore, our, our, who is now our director of engineering. Previously, he was at NASA. And distributed electric propulsion has a lot of benefits. Number one, most importantly, being noise. Uh, DEP, EV towels using DEP are quiet. They're far safer because they offer redundancy of numerous electric motors. They're far more efficient because they're all electric and they don't burn fuel. And most importantly, they're cost efficient. In fact, they're about 10 times more cost efficient than helicopters, 3x because of the wing and 3 to 4x because of the all electric rotors. And we've partnered with five different companies to go do this. Embraer, Aurora, Pipistrel, Mooney, and uh, Bell Helicopter. These are the five companies that we've partnered with to build these electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles and operate them on our network. We've also partnered with the cities of Dallas, and there we partnered with Ross Pro Jr., again, who you heard speak in the video. Uh, him and his, his Hillwood group, his group of Hillwood properties, have committed to building vertiports in the city of Dallas and Fort Worth uh, for these Uber vehicles to operate. We've also partnered with Dubai. Dubai is a true pioneering city of the future. Uh, and, and we've had a great time working with the RTA there, again, to launch our services there soon. So what does Uber bring to this entire equation? First of all, Uber brings the demand. So to, as I mentioned, we've got 65 million monthly active riders who I guarantee you, if today we were to put that Uber Air button in the app, all of them would want to fly to work. And so we're, we're really excited to bring that demand to what we're calling the Uber Elevate network. And we're partnering with companies all over the world with cities and governments, with investors, with NASA and air traffic control to make it all happen. So again, we're bringing the demand side. We're also building air traffic management systems. Just yesterday, we announced that we hired Tom Prevo, uh, who's formerly a director at NASA, who runs their air space management research lab. We hired Tom to build out a team at Uber to actually manage the flight of these high density, uh, low altitude operation vehicles. And uh, these trips will also inherently be multimodal, meaning push one button, a car will take you to your vertiport, and you'll get a flight from that point. Uh, one last partnership we have is ChargePoint. We've partnered with ChargePoint. ChargePoint is located in San Jose. ChargePoint is developing rapid rechargers for our network. This is super important because the faster you can charge your vehicle, the less time the vehicle spent on the ground, the more time they spend in the air, the more money they actually make on their asset. And so why are we here at EAA? Well, what we're doing is essentially, quintessentially, experimental aviation. In fact, as I looked at the companies here, I looked at Drone Terminus, which is doing autonomous package delivery for as low as five cents, which is amazing. We have an Uber Eats business, which would massively benefit from something like that, where today we charge $3, and sometimes your food can take up to 30 or 40 minutes to arrive. Take Flight is working on safer piloting techniques and training safer pilots, which is immensely huge because Uber will one day have more pilots than the entire United States uh, has today. And that's crazy when you think about it because that's going to be a massive, massive need for us. And so I can totally see startups such as the ones that are here today at the Pitch and Mingle event uh, eventually working with Uber. Pre-flight is training more female pilots, which is awesome. Today, nearly half of our drivers are women. In some countries like Saudi Arabia, I was recently in the Middle East, over 60 to 70% of our riders are women. And so I think this is an incredible initiative. And then TELUS is working on super, super awesome noise suppression techniques to make these vehicles quieter, which, as I mentioned earlier, is a major deal breaker for us if we can't get these vehicles quiet enough to operate in communities and cities effectively. So, so thanks again for having me here. Uh, you can reach us at elevate at uber.com. If you haven't read the white paper, please do. It's at uber.com slash elevate. We're also hiring. So if you're interested in, in joining our mission, reach out. Um, thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. We really appreciate that. I think it's safe to say, as we all know, is being involved in the innovation portion of aviation and aerospace, the world is changing. And this is a perfect example of it. Our four companies are also perfect examples of, of how the world is going to be changing very soon for us. So Nikhil had mentioned some of the Uber partners. And I also want to mention some of our partners. Before I do that, I, I also want to thank the atmosphere that we have here, which can be kind of crazy with the sounds, but it is aviation. It can't get any more aviation than this. So as we're interrupted by, by prop and jet noises, it's the way it is. And also, 
For those of you who are not from Wisconsin, welcome to Wisconsin. We're pairing aviation and deer hunting. So uh, before we go any further, I would like to uh, welcome one of our huge partners, and we literally would be out on the street if it was not for the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. So I'd like to introduce you to Chancellor Andrew Levitt. Thank you, Steve. Delighted to be here tonight. I want to add my welcome <clears throat> uh, to all of you for being out here tonight. So this very, very terrific and important event. I'm glad to hear that we're finally getting our flying cars. Uh, those of you who watched the Jetsons, as uh, all of us did at that time, uh, it's, it's uh, long overdue. So I'm glad that we're here today with that. So UW Oshkosh, so we're leading the way uh, with uh, sponsoring this accelerator. Uh, we've been sponsoring ex uh, aerospace accelerators uh, since, uh, well, this is our third year of Aero, Aero Innovate. As you've heard before, it was the ninth year of the Pitch and Mingle here. Why is this important to us? Uh, UW Oshkosh is very much involved in economic development uh, in this region, and this, uh, given our uh, long and close association with EAA, it makes all the sense in the world that this is uh, something that we should be doing together here. Uh, we also support entrepreneurship, as you can see from, from this effort and many others that we have going on at the university. We have great resources to help. Uh, and I would think like that's, I'd like to have that start with our faculty. Our faculty and staff are, are very talented and, and can make great contributions. Academic programming in aviation in partnership with the Fox Valley Technical College, which is uh, right here in Oshkosh, is, is, is very, very valuable. Uh, relationships, mentors, and great partners in the aerospace industry, and that's largely because of this fly-in. Uh, that we have uh, these, access to these resources. So I want to say thank you to a few people as we get started here. Uh, take a moment to thank our sponsors uh, and partners for this evening, the Department of Defense Office of Economic Adjustment, uh, the Wisconsin Economic Development uh, Corporation, uh, it's WEDC's very, very important partner to all of us uh, in the state of, of Wisconsin, Boeing, uh, EAA, uh, as um, Dave Champson, are you here tonight? I think I saw, there you are, Dave. Bear down. Yeah, we're both Arizona Wildcats, so um, the EAA and, of course, Generator, uh, which is um, new in this region uh, with the, uh, of all sorts of different programs here. They're going to be doing the G-Beta here in this region, so we're, we're thrilled the Generator is here as well. Uh, we'd like to also thank our Aero Innovate Ad Advisory Board members, and if you're an advisory board member, please raise your hand so we can thank you. They're, they're all in the back row. What is with this? There they are. They're all there. Okay. Thanks to C.R. Meyer for allowing us to use this terrific facility. Um, I usually am drowned out by faculty, so it's nice to hear airplanes once in a while, too. So. Uh, and then finally, I want to thank the four participants, the participants of the four companies in the class who spent countless hours over the past eight weeks uh, being a part of this program. I'm very, very eager to hear what they have to say tonight. I want to thank our own staff that's, that's led by Meredith Jager, but uh, Steve uh, Slocum has really stepped in and has done a fantastic job as the new director of Aero Innovate and the rest of the Aero Innovate team. And let me also thank, and I, I got to meet him again uh, tonight here, Kurt uh, Vaultheater, a co-founder of Aero Innovate, along with Meredith, uh, which is so it's nice that we kind of come full circle and have the people who helped start this uh, be here tonight as well. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Steve, and let's have a great evening. Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. We appreciate that. So now is the time we're all been waiting for. Let's start with our pitches. First of all, I'd like to introduce a lady who, as Nikhil talked about, has identified a problem in the aviation industry. That is the lack of female pilots in aviation. We all know that pilot shortage is looming as it is. Female pilots are drastically lower than, uh, than they should be and where they could be. And so Liz Duca from Pre-Flight Aviation Camp is here to tell us a little bit about what her company is going to do to solve that problem. Liz Duca. Aviation innovators, not AV. Innovators. All right. 
I'm going to try and do this with two hands. Well, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Aaron, Abate, Meredith. So hi, I'm Liz Duca, and the founder of Preflight Aviation Camp. Preflight is a nonprofit summer camp for girls that uses aviation to transform beliefs about gender roles, increase girls' self-esteem, and inspire more girls to become pilots. When I graduated Air Force pilot training, 3% of pilots were women. I went on to serve 10 years in the Air Force, where I flew the T-6, T-1, C-21, and KC-10 aircraft. But I can tell you, I didn't grow up imagining I would be a pilot. It wasn't until I met my friend Summer in college. She had her private pilot's license, and because of what she had achieved, I believed becoming a pilot was possible. I saw myself in her. She became my role model. So I applied to Air Force pilot training and was accepted. I remember the confidence I gained the first time I flew with a female instructor and the inspiration I received from the other female pilots in my units. I experienced firsthand the importance of finding a role model I could identify with. But the underrepresentation of women in aviation is not just in the military. It's seen in aviation as a whole. Out of over 580,000 FAA certificated pilots in the United States, only 6.6% of them are women. But this isn't the only problem. There's an overall pilot shortage, too. A recent Boeing study predicts that in North America alone, we will need 112,000 pilots for the next 20 years, and over 600,000 worldwide. We cannot just depend on half the population to fill this void. We need the entire population to believe it's an attainable goal to become a pilot. That's why pre-flight aviation camp is important. Just like a pilot has to pre-flight their airplane before they can take off, our camp is a girl's pre-flight into aviation. At pre-flight, the girls do hands-on STEM-based activities to learn about aerodynamics, flight controls, navigation, communication, and weight and balance. But pre-flight is not just about aviation. What sets us apart is our focused approach to relate each aviation topic back to broader life lessons. We provide a balanced curriculum to teach teamwork, build a girl's self-esteem, and provide successful female role models to empower them to believe they can be pilots too. And at pre-flight, a girl also gets the exclusive opportunity to pilot a simulator and fly in one of our, our airplanes with our female pilots. It's in that moment that, grad, that campers graduate from seeing to believing. 100% of campers strongly agreed they learned aviation concepts that taught them to believe being a pilot was possible and that they feel more confident because they attended pre-flight. Pre-flight operates in San Marcos, Texas through a partnership with the Texas State University Air Force ROTC Department. Our model is a five-day overnight camp that uses existing infrastructure at a university for dormitory, cafeteria, and classroom use. We target 28,000 girls ages 11 to 14 in the cities of San Marcos, New Braunfels, and San Antonio, and we're looking to reach girls in Austin this year. Our goal is to build three, up to three camps in San Marcos by 2020, after which we'd like to take this Texas model and apply it to one new market each year. If we do this, we have the potential to reach over 1,000 girls each year by 2028. We had our first camp in 2016, and after talking with parents, every one of the campers say they want to be a pilot now. Our next camp is scheduled for 26 June to 30 June 2018, with 40 campers. Camp registration is $950, and with our camp this year, we will generate $38,000 in revenue. Preflight in 2016 was a huge success, but in order to take it to the next level, 
We need partners with general aviation aircraft and female certified flight instructors to fly the campers. Female college students in aviation programs who can serve as camp counselors. Subject matter experts who can come in to provide hands-on activities that are more impactful. And scholarships so that any girl can attend pre-flight. All of these things are vital to creating an unforgettable camp experience for the girls at pre-flight. If you think you could help, I would love to hear from you. And we're currently accepting donations on our website. But pre-flight could not exist if it weren't for my incredible team. We're all military trained pilots who now fly in a variety of roles, ranging from major airlines to Air Force to corporate and US Forest Service pilots. And I already told you about the woman on the far right, Summer, my original mentor and the woman who inspired me to become a pilot. If we want to see more women enter in the field of aviation and ensure we have enough pilots to meet the demands of the future, we need pre-flight aviation camp. Thank you. Hi, my name is Murray Rosansky. I happen to be president of a division of the Soaring Society of America. I gave a forum today on reducing the cost of flight training by going to glider-based flight training. And I wonder if you've considered it. It's potentially, not currently, but potentially much less expensive than doing basic training in power planes. Uh, kids can solo at 14. And if you catch kids earlier, it's much better in terms of retention. And uh, just wonder whether you've considered that. I think that's uh, really exciting to try and incorporate into pre-flight. We want to inform the girls of all the ways they become, can become pilots. And the sooner they can get in the airplane and start getting lessons and get to that solo, uh, the better. And I think something like that, I would love to talk to you more after this. You know, if a girl can just solo an airplane, I mean, that does so much to her confidence, she'll have a skill that other kids in her school don't have. And that's where we like to relate that aviation back to building that self-esteem and getting to do that early and providing that opportunity for them would be something great to, to incorporate. So I'd love to talk to you again after this. Hi. Hi. Uh, there are a couple of very well-known groups for women in aviation, like the 99s, Women in Aviation International. I'm just wondering, have you considered reaching out in some way through those organizations? So I'm actually a member of both of those organizations. And um, there are women in both of those in the local chapters in San Antonio that have helped out with the camp. And so we're really trying to build this community of people to get behind this movement because we need really focused and intentional outreach. And so I, I'm planning to you know, expand on that network and hopefully get more support from both of those. Hi, yes. Hi, Liz. Um, I love what you're doing. I think it's a fabulous idea. And, um, and I love that you've chosen a nonprofit uh, format to do it in. I'm curious, do you see, as you ask for sponsorship dollars, are, do you see those sponsorship dollars going primarily for infrastructure costs, airplanes, things like that? Do you see, do you see your nonprofit um, operating off of the registration fees? plus scholarships, um, or can you say a little bit more about the funding model? Sure, so right now the registration fee when we have 40 girls is gonna essentially cover the operating costs of the camp, but then we have all that administrative and GNA afterwards. And so that's where, as a nonprofit, we'll have the opportunity to write grants and apply and do some fundraising in order to get those additional dollars that we need in order to keep our program going and hopefully to expand to make it bigger and better for the coming years. You're making me walk. I, th I think it's a, a really great idea. The question I have is how do you scale it? It seems like you're gonna be limited by the number of, of female pilots that you can, that you can mentor. And it, it seems like, you know, how do you ever get outside of Texas, if you will? 
Well, I think if we can build a really strong model in Texas that then other people can use to take to their local areas, then you know we'll be able to also, one of the ways we're trying to scale is bringing in those college students, those girls that are in aviation programs, so that we can have you know, many of those women in the summer have a longer camp and then have those subject matter experts, the professional pilots, coming in at different periods throughout the camp to teach those specialized lessons. So I think that if we're able to get a lot of those uh, college age girls to be that base for the counselors, then also we have the, you know, campers that can come back as counselors in the future is how we'd like to see that. And so with support as far as volunteers, I think we can get it, I believe that we can get it to be a bigger and, and, and larger camp for a longer period of time. Thank you. What's your um, plan of getting airplanes and CFIs? Are you gonna rent from flight schools or rent from universities or what, what's the model that you're looking at there? So for the first camp, we rented, and we had a certified female flight, flight instructor from the 99s that flew the flights. And again, that goes back to partnering with universities that have aviation programs because they have the resources. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of women in those programs, and so we've been trying to network here at Oshkosh to try and identify those women. And I know that the counselors as well that are currently involved, we're looking to get our, our CFIs. We were instructors in the Air Force, but don't have that civilian um, you know, certification. So getting women to go to our website and that do have that certification to apply to be a, a volunteer uh, flight instructor. One or two more questions. Does anybody have any further questions for Liz? Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, you know, to scale this. The enrollment uh, revenue that you're getting now is, is always going to be somewhat limited uh, mm -hmm. if, if you reach people who don't have the resources. What I keep thinking is you look around this campus here today, some of the best heel people in the world are here. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all have kids, female kids and grandkids, and a lot of us great grandkids. So a plan to really farm that at least for five days a year <laughs> to everybody here that owns an airplane, everybody that shows, there's 10,000 airplanes here. So there's a lot of revenue that would flow in if they got this message. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I think that's one of the benefits of being in this program is to inform people about what we are trying to build and getting that support to get more volunteers and more resources, airplanes, female CFIs, to then grow from five days to five weeks and having something throughout the summer. And I think, you know, it's uh, a continual process of re, you know, seeing what works and what doesn't work. We had camp was four days the first year, and now we're at five. And so we're constantly discussing uh, with the board, you know, how are we going to modify this and grow it? And I, with more support, we can do that. And so I'm hoping that, you know, the audience here and those that we're reaching at Oshkosh will reach out to us on our website and we can discuss more how to get this program scaled so we can reach as many girls as possible because we can't just hope that girls are gonna be inspired to be pilots. We need to be actively providing them with an educational opportunity through camp to be inspired to be pilots. As in addition to aviation pilots and low numbers of women, we also have low numbers of maintenance, mm -hmm. women in maintenance. Have you thought about branching into that as well as you move forward? I think there's lots of possibilities that we can go with this. You know, if we had a five week camp and each week was those subject matter experts and all those career fields coming in to mentor and inspire the girls with really impactful hands on activities, and then we culminate with, you know, taking off and that's the pilot week, that would be really cool. And, you know, it, as an Air Force pilot and just in general in any, um, capacity as a pilot. There's a lot of people involved to get you off the ground. And so having that concept there with camp could definitely be something that we focus and expand on so that every topic, every career field in aviation that is, you know, limited in the numbers of women can be, 
can be built up and, and increased. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. What a, what a fantastic message. And, and sir, you're absolutely right that you know, we want to tap into this, this environment here. And this is really kind of meant to be sort of a coming out party, a debut for these, five, for these four companies to let them, to let you know what they're all about and why you should care and why you should take their message forward. Now, of these companies, some of them are going to be looking for investors. Some of them are going to be looking for sponsorships. They're probably all looking for condi conditional or uh, continual mentors and board members. So um, please keep that in mind as you're listening. There's many different ways that you can help, help these folks out. So our next, speaking of, that's also a great segue to our next partner. We have Dave Jameson here from the EAA. He's the Vice President of Marketing, and Dave is also a member of our Aero Innovate Advisory Board, and he is a mentor to many of the companies that you see here tonight. So, Dave Jameson. Thank you, Steve. Good evening and welcome to Oshkosh. It's uh, fantastic to be here this evening. We couldn't be more thrilled. Little day of rain today, but I assure you the rest of the week will be phenomenal in terms of weather. Uh, EAA has been a, a very strong partner of Aero Innovate in the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh for the last uh, many years, last several years I personally have been involved. And I get great satisfaction out of mentoring some of the companies. Uh, EAA is certainly all about honoring the past, the present, and the future in terms of what aviation has to offer. And there's nothing better than understanding the future than inviting these companies in to participate at the world's greatest aviation celebration. EAA provides free booth space and free resources to the companies that come here for the summer and through pitch camp. And it's just been a pleasure to work with them and get to know them and to watch them grow. Some have gone on to be full-fledged exhibitors, and it allows us, of course, to make some money back on them as well. So thanks again for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest of the week, and uh, if you get a chance to stop by and say hi, I'll be walking all around the grounds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. We definitely appreciate the support from EAA. It's been fantastic. So next up, as, as many of you know, drone delivery from companies like Amazon and and even your pizza being delivered via drone is, is something that's been talked about for a long time. And it's, I think we all realize that something of that nature is coming. So if it's coming, and it's going to land at your house, where is it going to land? And how is it going to do that safely? So that's a problem that Joe McMillian from Drone Terminus is looking to solve. Joe McMillian. Hello, Hello, everyone. Whoa. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Joe. I'm here today to talk about my startup, Drone Terminus. We want to make drone delivery a reality sooner than later. We're co-founded by a former senior manager of Amazon Prime Air, and we're building a universal appliance that'll make, that'll make drone delivery feasible. Think of it as a smart, internet-connected drone helipad that will automatically receive, store, and secure your package. Our goal is to make life easier for companies like Amazon while making drone delivery available for everyone. There's a lot of big money backing this technology. Delivery times and costs will be greatly reduced. Cutting the number of vehicles on the road will help ease traffic and congestion. And drone delivery can provide almost instantaneous gratification, so you can get what you want when you want it. We've all come home expecting a package and found one of these notices instead. The last mile for package delivery is an expensive opportunity, and the last mile for drone delivery is no different. Current methods of drone delivery all involve human intervention at the point of transfer. But keep in mind that 72% of packages are delivered when no one's home. There are other problems with proposed methods of drone delivery. The infrastructure required to expand delivery footprint is costly. Onboard drone technologies limit payloads, and human intervention at the point of transfer promotes the possibility of collision, which inhibits adoption. Keep in mind that the business consumer market is only a part of the whole. We 
We're building a universal appliance that will automatically receive packages from multiple drone designs. We're incorporating modular scanning, landing, and communication technologies that will allow any fleet operator to schedule and make a delivery. Our appliance is smart and aware of its surroundings. We're using artificial intelligence to provide augmented sense and avoidance data from the ground up. We're using thermal camera capture and ultra wideband scanning to detect hazards at the point of descent and notify the drone in real time. Our appliance is an inductive recharging platform. We can provide the opportunity for a fleet operator to exponentially increase their delivery footprint. It can be made to take any shape and incorporated into existing architecture. Your packages are automatically received, stored, inside a drone terminus kept safe from theft and the elements until you're ready to retrieve them. The business to consumer market will only be feasible for those fleet operators that have enough capital to, to build the infrastructure required needed to operate them. Our appliance can act as that infrastructure allowing everyone to take advantage of, of scheduling and making their own deliveries. With our patent pending technology, we can make drone delivery affordable and available to everyone. We're proposing a consumer subsidized pricing model provided by fleet operators that includes installation, maintenance, and per use charges of 50 cents per parcel. These same fleet operators deliver more than three million packages per day that can be delivered by drone. With a strong background in drones, robotics, and business development, we have the right team in place to take this product to market. After capital infusion, we're gonna build out our software, perfect our hardware, and begin testing in the US and foreign markets. We're gonna integrate with the NASA UTM, projected to occur in 2019, and we're gonna to look to build partnerships with drone oper fleet operators and drone manufacturers. We look to establish the market for automated package receivers. Drone delivery is coming, and the drone terminus can help make that happen. Thank you. Questions for Joe? I've got a question. Was my voice cutting in and out when I was going like this? A little bit. Okay. Little bit. Sorry. Sure. Hi. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, what stops someone from just coming up and taking the package that it wasn't intended for? Well, first of all, it's locked. Okay. Secondarily, these are cameras right here on the outside. Even though they're thermal camera capture, you know, we can still probably get your face off of them as well. Okay. Uh, thirdly, basically it's locked inside. You would access it via a smartphone app or a PIN code that you're provided. Okay. The same thing if you were sending a package as well. You wouldn't be able to send that package or even put it into the device until you received a PIN code or your smartphone app said that it had been scheduled for okay. delivery and the receiver of the package knew that the package was coming to them. Okay. Then we have to also measure the weight to weigh it to make sure it matches up to the pre predicted weight that the package is supposed to weigh, as well as scan with a barcode or a RFID reader. So keep in mind, this is not only a receiver, the future, this will also be a, you, allow you the capacity to ship and send your own packages using this drone delivery technology. Thank you. How you doing? Good, good, uh, good idea on this. Um, do you have patents filed yet and, uh, or, and or awarded? Because I know of a company called Drone Deck that has exactly the same thing that I can see, at least. I don't know what your differentiation is there. Yeah, we have two patents pending, um, one for the algorithms associated with this and some for the internal mechanisms that were custom made. Um, yeah, there are, I haven't heard of Drone Deck, so I can't speak of that, but um, there are a lot of people pursuing this technology. Um, so I'll have to check them out. But yeah, we have two patents pending right now. They were awarded? Okay. I'll have to check them out. Hi. Hey, thanks. Great presentation. Nice and to the point. Good job. Thanks. Question on 
I assume you're going to operate zero to 400 feet AGL, right? Yeah, well, we're not going to be operating the drones. We're going to be providing to the drone oper data to the drone operators. Okay. So in terms of tracking and communications, what, in a high-level sense, I don't need to know your trade secrets, do you all plan to use? Uh, we're basically going to ask the fleet operators what they require. So we are going to have a call for sensors and arrays and whatever the data they need, I'm sure we can uh, apply. Basically, uh, we're going to make everything modular. So as technology progresses, we can yank it and replace it as needed. No, uh, that's Which the arrays sensor. specifically? Uh, yeah. Most people are using, you know, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth uh, to communicate directly with the drone when it's in the area. But within the under 400 feet airspace, would you employ as V2V, cellular, or ADSB, which one are you all thinking oh, of? Oh, um, not cellular. Thanks. Not cellular. So you may have said this. Um, is it one per household, one per neighborhood? And then the other question was, who's buying the stands? Is it you, is it Amazon, or is it the user? Okay, this model specifically here, and this is the one that we're also building our hardware prototype on, is a multi-bay unit. Uh, and individual residents wouldn't require a multi-bay unit. We could put one there if needed, but we have a design up for a single bay unit at a residence that's smaller, basically, than this. Now, in regards to payment, uh, in our subsidized consumer pricing model, we have basically put together a plan similar to a cell phone plan provided by your provider. You're probably not paying full price for your cell phone. You may have a monthly subscription fee, you know, similar to an Amazon Prime, Prime model. So it might be a per usage, but really we're looking to license to a fleet operator because they have the capital necessary to go and install these. These would need to be professionally installed, make sure there's clear line of sight, hooked up to the internet, et cetera, made to make sure that everything's work in working order. Thank you, Joe. Note to self, don't cross mics. So, as I had mentioned before, uh, Aero Innovate is an eight-week virtual accelerator until we come on site here in Oshkosh. Uh, we work very closely with a company based out of uh, Milwaukee in, in Madison, Wisconsin, that is one of the top ten accelerator companies in the country. So, here is one of the co-founders of Generator, Mr. Troy Vossler. Thanks for that warm introduction. It's been my privilege to be consulting and working with each of the four Aero Innovate participants over the course of the past eight weeks. I can speak from experience that I think far and away this is the best cohort that I've seen come through the program, and that says a lot just given the number of tremendous companies that have come through this experience. So let's give them all a tremendous round of applause. The parting thoughts that I'd like to give the audience tonight are you're going to hear four great presentations tonight. You've already heard two, you have two more. What I'd like to ask is if you're fortunate or in such a position to be able to be an investor or consider being an investor, I'd encourage you to have a private one-on-one -on -one conversation with any of the companies that you find interesting and continue that conversation. If you're able to be a customer, either personally, individually, or on behalf of a business or a corporation, please have that conversation with one of these four companies tonight. And then lastly, if you're in a position to mentor and want to give back, give feedback, give advice, please volunteer, your, please volunteer your time, your network, and available resources to these four companies. So invest, mentor, and buy. Keep that in mind. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Appreciate it. Thank you, Troy. So next, most of you, or many of you, are probably pilots yourselves, and you've gone through flight training. And if you're not a pilot yourself, you certainly know pilots, and you know that it is expensive, and it takes a long time. Brandon Seltz is here from Take Flight International, and he has a great way to help solve this problem. Brandon? Thanks, Steve. Again, my name is Brandon Seltz, founder of Take Flight Interactive. We develop a simulation-based training platform that uses real-time data analysis and artificial intelligence to provide interactive training and evaluation of pilot performance. 
By adding immersive elements to traditional simulation, such as real-time feedback and objective scoring, we transform simulators into virtual instructors. Since forming Take Flight in 2015, we have over $200,000 in revenue, and in a recent project with Alaska Airlines, five or four students with no previous aviation experience soloed the aircraft 50% faster using Take Flight than traditional methods. My team has been working on this vision for over 15 years. We first worked together at Microsoft on Flight Simulator, where we introduced millions to aviation. And then again, at Redbird Simulations, we showed that game-based interactive simulation can transform the training experience. And I've been practicing my whole life to build this company. I'm a pilot and a game designer who grew up with simulation. When I started my flight training, I took off for the first time, looked over the wing and thought, I've done this a million times. I went on to get my license in minimum time at minimum cost, and I was amazed at how valuable my time using low-cost simulation had been. Yet the industry doesn't utilize simulation for primary training. People still learn to fly the way they did 75 years ago, primarily in the airplane. Unfortunately, the costs of training this way have reached a tipping point. Cost is listed as the number one concern for those considering a pilot license, and for those thinking about a career as a pilot, the initial salary hardly justifies the expense. And we've heard it before. Aircraft make terrible classrooms. They're noisy, they make new students nervous, and they're expensive. Well, the results are clear. There's a 70% dropout rate in student pilots. With the pilot shortage looming, something has to change. And our training platform is a game changer. By shifting costs away from expensive aircraft, to low-cost simulation, we can reduce the cost of a private pilot license by 40% on average while still meeting re FAA regulations. And with an engaging and fun curriculum, we can reach that next generation of aviators and reduce the dropout rate. Millennials demand an experiential training experience, and we it's exactly what we have. This is a look at our training platform, Take Flight Academy. You log in, you see an integrated curriculum, it shows your past performance as well as exactly what you need to do next. You select a maneuver and it launches that scenario on the sim. Simple as that. While flying, you hear feedback based on your performance just like you would in an airplane. And when finished, you see a score based on FAA standards. This allows for self-evaluation, shows exactly where you need to improve. And our, sh our scenarios are short and to the point so you can quickly refly and put that feedback into practice. It's not until you're proficient in the simulator do you validate those skills in the airplane. This reduces time to, to mastery and enables much more efficient use of aircraft time, such as flying cross country as pilot in command, learning valuable lessons instead of just flying back and forth to the practice area. Our platform is simulator software and hardware agnostic. So you can use a $1,000 laptop and joystick, VR, or full motion simulation. So you can practice at home or at the flight school with your progress stored in the cloud. We have a software as a service revenue model where users subscribe to an ever growing library of training content. And future revenue will come from technology licensing and data. Our conservative initial target market are the 600,000 pilots here in the US, but we know there's a huge demand for our products overseas in Asia, the Middle East, and emerging economies, where commercial air travel is growing exponentially, yet little flight training infrastructure exists. Even though we have some early revenue, we're just getting started. Here's a high-level look at our roadmap. Within the year, we'll finish the private pilot curriculum and start on instrument pilot then we'll look to penetrate the commercial and military space. We are seeking partners, board members, and mentors to help us define our path to success. But know that our technology can reduce or increase the training uh, efficiency across industries. We're starting in aviation because we're passionate about it, and flight training is ripe for disruption. But, but we can increase the training efficiency across industries. There's so much more I'd like to show and tell, so please come see me at my table here or visit us in booth IC3 at the Innovation Pavilion. Thank you.
Questions for Brandon? Yes. Uh, you said there's a market of 216 million with 600,000 pilots, but how many new pilots each year? Approximately 50,000 new pilots come into the system each year. If we could reduce that dropout rate, there'd be a lot more. Nicely done. So do you think this is applicable only to new pilots, or do you see applications where recurring pilots could use this level of training as well? I definitely do. Our subscriptions are in tiers, like private instrument, but we'll also have smaller packages aimed at proficiency. Have you considered, as part of your market, uh, non-pilots? My wife just uh, nudged me in the shoulder and said, Take flight would be good for the wives of pilots, too, They're, and children of pilots. Yeah. You might want to think about a larger market. Yeah, I definitely do. It's something that we've observed here at Oshkosh specifically. We've had a lot of pilots' wives at the booth wanting to give it a try because they see how approachable it is, and uh, they do have a desire to fly, and this definitely makes it approachable and easy to learn. Hi, thanks. Hi. You're welcome. Lynn Lindbergh here. I love seeing how new technologies intersect with each other and then my question was around age restrictions for taking this because as I see it as a little girl I could take take flight I could go to pre-flight camp and when I forget my favorite stuffed animal at camp the drone turn miss can get it back to my home <laughs> so, yeah, right. so age restrictions I'd love to hear about yeah sure yeah I can't wait to work with Liz I think we you know together we can do some great things there are no age restrictions. You know, I think that's what's beautiful about this. It's just like me when I was a kid, fascinated with aviation, playing with simulation, I was learning. And so kids can do this at any age. There's no restriction to using our software. Uh, you know, this time in the sim isn't logged. Uh, it's just beneficial when you get into the airplane. So we've seen so many kids come through the booth that are passionate about aviation, that are using simulation, that jump in there, and it's incredible how much they've already learned. Uh, with the with your background in gaming mm -hmm. design um, and with the online gaming that's taken place with kids, have you thought about teaming up with um, EA Sports or with my, some game design company that says, "Hey, we have you know right now online 10 million people playing the simulator. Uh, they've been identified to have the skills to be a future pilot. Can we just instant send a message?" We'd like to recruit you. Um, that would be great. I would love to partner with people that know of a pool that are interested in aviation. And yeah, the very game-like nature of our product would appeal to them. You know, I think one of our revenue streams is actually that simulation entertainment uh, component there. I think there's actually uh, quite a few people that are interested in that, and I think we can bring them into aviation through games like this. Games. Thank you. Thank you. Brandon. <laughs> Mrs. Lindbergh, the check is in the mail. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that tie-in. That was awesome. So all the companies are looking for some type of help, whether it's financial or otherwise. Air Innovate as well needs financial help, and we often rely on our grant process for that. So, from WEDC, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Dave Volz. Thank you, Steve. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Chancellor, but I didn't realize that Bear Down was also a University of Arizona thing, but I'm really glad you clarified that because it has a way different context for Packer fans, and I'm glad I still get to respect you, so. Um, WEDC, we're the State Level Economic Development Agency. Um, I'm part of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Team, and it's through one of our programs that we provide financial support to the Aero Innovate Accelerator and to the participating startups. Um, it's just one of the ways in which WDC interacts with Aero Innovate. Many of you may know my colleague, Gail McCaskill, who works with Aero Innovate and the broader organizations in the, in the cluster in support of you know, broader uh, strategic initiatives. But um, consortium across all industries increasingly see a key tactic to their growth and development as 
um, identifying, nurturing, adopting uh, new ideas and innovations um, into their sectors. So obviously you can see where our work um, overlaps and, and aligns very well with what Aero Innovate's doing. So please support it. Um, a compliment from Troy Vossler from Generator to this cohort means a lot because he's seen it all. So congratulations on your successes to date. Um, best luck for continued success. We hope to see some of that growth and development either immediately or eventually find its way to Wisconsin. We can help you do that. But uh, best of luck to you. Um, thank you for dreaming big and thank you for helping shape the future and I uh, look forward to continued success. So this is a perfect atmosphere to understand that noise is a problem in the aviation industry. So here to talk to us a little bit about how we can solve that problem and address some of the federal mandates that are coming up on noise reduction is Mr. Russell Kirkman from TELUS Aerospace. All right. Thank you, Steve. So my, my name is... My name is Russell Kirkman. I'm the CEO of TELUS Aerospace. We design and manufacture acoustic liners based on a revolution in NASA technology that was designed to suppress noise for jet engines and other aircraft engines. So we won the space race competition last year to afford us the right to license this NASA technology. And right here you're seeing a, a concept prototype of the liner that we designed. So aircraft noise has been a problem, obviously, we're seeing here for <laughs> throughout the show and, and, and other ways, uh, over your house, right, at the worst times possible. And the mandates for noise reduction have been around since actually in the 1970s. Okay, aircraft manufacturers have actually done quite a bit in uh, re uh, do redesigning the engines and different parts of the plane to reduce noise. However, it's been in little incremental bits, and we believe that our noise suppression technology can take actually a big chunk out of that, okay? So the FAA and IKO regulations are requiring a negative 39 decibel or an, a 39 decibel drop in noise from aircraft between now and the year 2025. Now, the important thing about that 39 decibels is what you see here on the screen. That's a 99% reduction in actual volume of the amplitude of the volume of the aircraft that you're hearing, okay? Let me repeat that, 99%, okay? Uh, this is an, a seemingly insurmountable problem that the aircraft engine manufacturers face, and TELUS actually has a way to fix this, okay? So, one of the keys to our design is that we address a multiple range of frequencies, and we do so in a reduced profile. So we're not impeding into the bypass region of the aircraft, and we allow the thrust profile to remain untouched and to uh, maximize the amount of power output that these engines can do while silencing them. Okay, we are making it out of a ceramic composite material that I worked on when I was doing my research as a, as a student. And that allows us to place, that combined with the geometries allows us to place it around the combustion core of a turbojet or a turbofan or a turboprop engine, okay? And those two things combined, like I said, gives us the ability to make the smallest footprint of a, a liner possible. Uh, currently today, nacelle liners are uh, only capable really of reducing the fan inlet noise, and that's only one or two frequencies that are generated. As you well know, as you take off and land and you're, 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 you know, you're changing your speeds and things, the amount of, or the frequencies of noise change. So by using a multiple depth cell design, we can address a broad range and take care of uh, across the board free, uh, noise suppression. We plan to sell this to engine manufacturers for $140,000 per engine which represents actually a pretty minimal cost for the amount of noise reduction we're talking about. And bear in mind that every time a plane takes off and lands from an airport that doesn't meet those noise restrictions that I was talking about earlier, they pay a fine. And guess who pays for that fine? All of you guys who are in the airplanes. So our customer base is uh, military, commercial, and business class engine manufacturers. 
We're also talking to the, the aircraft manufacturers themselves for aftermarket add-ons for exhaust manifolds and things like that. And with a forecast of 6,000 new engines per year, with $140,000 per engine, we're looking at an annual market of about $840 million. And that's just new engines alone in the commercial and business class space. So our team is comprised of myself, I'm CEO. I come from, like I mentioned, NASA Ames Advanced Studies Labs where I worked on high temperature composites. And we have Bruno Selvas, our, C our, our COO. He comes from Carnegie Mellon University and is a serial entrepreneur that has multiple startup exits. And our, uh, Yosune Kasana, who's out there in the audience today cheering me on, uh, she's our chief technology officer. And I met her at San Jose State when we were both uh, doing our work towards our degree. And her experience is with brittle materials, and she's also an ex-researcher with uh, Harvard Condensed Soft Matter Group. So where we are right now is that NASA has invested a significant amount of resources to prove the concept of their geometries. However, the next step is actually doing simulations and testing on a, a concept design, building that prototype, and validating its durability for the engine manufacturers. And then finally, working with those manufacturers to get it qualified for regulation. We're looking at a $5 million development cost, not including uh, certification costs. And which about over a two-year time, we're looking at our development uh, timeline, which reaches uh, revenue in year three. And we're looking at a profitability in year five. So I'd like to remind you of the profound uh, problem that we're facing with aircraft noise and the fact that TELUS actually has a solution to this today, not decades from today. So thank you. I appreciate your time. Please uh, fire, fire the questions away. I know you're, you're aching at it, right? <laughs> hey, Russell, great job. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, the last slide, the $5 million, if you could talk sure. to what what makes up that five million? Okay, so for the first year, we're looking at doing simulations and modeling. So we need, uh, or it's going to cost us a, a certain amount of uh, uh, output to uh, acquire the simulations and modeling uh, hardware and software. We're also looking at doing uh, physical testing on the materials themselves to hone in on what actual comp compositions are going to be right for the application. And so over the first year, we're looking at about a, a $1.5 million cost to, to, to get to that point where we can build an actual working prototype. And then on the second year, we'll be testing that prototype to validate its functionality and then working with the, the, the customers to uh, customize that for a specific engine design. And that's where the other three and a half or so million dollars comes in. Hey, Russell, how's it going? Hi. Uh, just quickly, you mentioned that NASA had already spent a, a good deal of money developing the cell geometry and things like that. Can you yep. talk about how you're accessing the IP and to what level of exclusivity you're accessing that? Okay, so um, we actually are in, we have a, a non-exclusive license currently that we gained in December of last year after we won the space race competition. But we are in negotiations currently for an exclusivity in the aircraft market. So. Within the next couple of months or so, we'll be the only game in town with this technology. I have a, I have a, I have a picture of... So this is the, the, the way that the technology works and what's special about it is that, you know, nacelle liners have a single cell depth and it's a straight cell, okay? And what happens is the, the sound wave will enter a chamber and when it hits the back side of the chamber, it reflects and creates a canceling wave, similar to what you would see in a Bose headphone set, right? And what the guys at NASA did, they tested and developed this, this idea of having a vent cell or link cells in succession, which allows us to spread the thickness of the liner across the, the axial part of the engine. So we can actually put you know, something that would have taken maybe 15, 20 inches of depth before to reach the lower frequencies. We can attack that with uh, two or three inches worth of depth. So our profile is minimal at, at, at worst, right? Thank you for that. Yes? Did they use, um, did NASA use this on any of their spacecraft? There's one question. And then who would you say your main two competitors are? And what does your technology or NASA's technology have 
over theirs. Okay, so um, they, uh, from what I was working on at NASA, it was actually an ablative technology. So that's where the ceramic composite part of this comes from. And so the different, so it's kind of funny because the competitors we have are somewhat the engine manufacturers themselves. They have internal teams working on things to, to do to suppress noise. However, as far as I know, we're the only ones that have uh, access to, or that we have the capability to put a liner around the, the combustion section of the engine. And that's due to these geometries that they, they, they created. So I, I, I guess an indirect competitor would be the nacelle liner manufacturers like a, like a Nexcel or a Hexcel or a GKN Aerospace. Those are the, the guys that are probably a little nervous that we're coming around. Because <laughs> this is actually applicable in the nacelle liner as well. It's just not our first target. Have you got any uh, actual measured data? Yes. That uh, okay. would show so, you how this would work? Yeah, the, the guys at NASA have uh, uh, done pretty extensive testing in G-fit tubes. Uh, grazing flow instance tubes to prove that this is functional, okay? So they, we have data that shows that it can go anywhere from 20 decibels of a, a suppression, and in some very specific frequencies, it can even get upwards of about 50 decibels of suppression. So now uh, understand that that's one or two frequencies that the, the length of the, t the cells have been tuned for, however, if we attack the very loudest frequencies, we can dramatically reduce the, the engine noise even at 20, 30 decibels of a drop. Uh, thank you. Can you help us understand uh, the difference between noise that's generated within the engine and noise that's generated outside of the engine okay. after it's exited and how this technology will address that? Okay, so there's, there's really the three biggest sources of noise in an engine are the fan blade spinning, the exhaust, and the combustion noise that goes on within the, the internal workings of the engine. So engine manufacturers, obviously the nacelle liners, have, have addressed the, the, the fan blade noise. And they've been doing a lot of work on uh, chevrons and different shapes for the exhaust manifold and to deal with that exhaust noise. But Remaining, and what's still a lot of the noise that still remains in the aircraft engines is the combustion noise. I mean, you hear every time they hit an afterburner out here, it's just like you feel it in your chest, and it's like, you know, boom, right? So that, that kind of combustion noise is really, it, they, don't, they don't really have a way to address it yet, and that's what the guys at NASA got so much funding and support uh, from the engine manufacturers themselves and the FAA actually were behind a lot of that uh, support for the grant money, you know, to, to get that program going. So, yeah. I might have missed this part, but uh, how much weight would you be adding roughly per engine, and then what would the cost be? Okay, so it, it very much depends on what frequencies they're addressing and what size of the engine. It's going to be quite a bit different weight. I mean. So the ceramic composite, the way I can address that question is the ceramic composite is actually three times less dense than an aluminum alloy or a titanium alloy or aluminum titanium mixture. So as far as the weight additive, there, there's always going to be a trade-off when you add a new component to an engine, of course. But we believe that the materials that we're utilizing will have a minimal impact on that. So what aircraft have you been testing with? What's a popular aircraft that you've been wanting to target? Um, well, of course, the LEAP engine, one of the Trent engines, those are the ones we want to get on, the GE9X. Okay. These, are, these are high thrust, high output engines that have the loudest signatures, and, and those are really the ones that, you know, the aircraft manufacturer or the airlines would love to fly these, like, giant Dreamliners into the small airports, and they're restricted. They can't do that right now. So, you know, this would, this would actually likely enable them to fly these huge planes into small airports and not be uh, disturbing the residents nearby. So the engines that you've been studying, what would be the weight and the price for those? I, I don't have those calculations yet. We're, we're very much in the uh, modeling and simulation stage. Thank you, Russell.
think uh, we're good to go. All right. And thank you very much for the questions. So before we go tonight, I, I'd like to, uh, we've, we've talked a little bit about the partners that we have here for Aero Innovate. This year we added a new partner that I'm extremely excited about. Boeing, Horizon X came on board and, and Jacob Schneider over here in project management was extremely beneficial in helping drive this partnership because I, I believe that he saw the, the, the connection that, that Boeing, Horizon X could have with, with an organization like uh, Aero Innovate. And during that time that he came on, it's kind of towards the end of, the, of our eight week session, but he came on with his team guns blazing and really jumped in and helped with mentorship of our four companies and providing advice and help as we move along. So I would like to introduce you, Jacob Schneider from Boeing Horizon X. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Um, so as Steve mentioned, I am from Boeing Horizon X Ventures, and we are a new organization that just launched in April. And what my team is tasked with doing is identifying early stage opportunities within technology companies like yourselves that solve some of our core problems. And as we realize the pace of innovation is achieving a velocity that is unmatched in the history of the world, we no longer can go to the traditional mechanisms for growth, like traditional M&A or organic R&D. And so that's where my team and I are really tasked with looking at these emerging companies and identifying the ones that are really taking a problem-driven innovation approach that understands the core problem sets in the industry and in turn the ones that we're experiencing so we can help partner and engage them in a way that drives the industry forward. And that's exactly what we've seen here. This is actually my first time in Oshkosh and I could not be more impressed with what is going on. Not only out there, um, but in here, and more importantly, what's going on in this stage, and, and what you guys are doing, and the problems that you guys are solving. I think anyone in this room could relate to, and though that type of entrepreneurship is what carries us forward, and so I could not be more excited to participate in this. I could not thank you guys enough to have the invitation and uh, to represent Boeing here, and so uh, I say thank you, I say good luck, and uh, great job tonight. So that concludes our program tonight. Before we go, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you once again to all of you for showing up tonight. As I said at the beginning, I know there's a lot going on in AirVenture. I'm sure you had other things that you could be a part of, but you chose to come here, and I really appreciate that. Thank you to all of our uh, Aero Innovate Advisory Board members. Those of you who are here, thank you so much. Thank you to those of you who are mentors to these companies, sponsors, partners. We couldn't do this without the help of all of you. So if you have further questions for any of our four companies or myself or Meredith, please come see us afterwards. Our four companies will be over here. Please enjoy something to eat or drink. Enjoy the air show tonight. I'm sure Dave would appreciate that if you went out to the, the EAA or Venture air show. And um, please, please join us again here next year um, as we do this for the 10th year at Aero Innovate 2018. Uh, applications are currently available right now on our website, so if you or someone you know is an aviation aerospace innovator and you would like to apply to our program for 2018, it's on our website, aeroinnovate.org. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Have a safe travel home, and we'll see you again next year. Thank you. Thank you.